Connors T, how are ye? Welcome to the Candlelit Tales podcast. We are breathing life back into Irish myths with traditional Irish storytelling accompanied by music. My name is Sarika and I'm one of the co-founders of Candlelit Tales. And in this episode, you'll be hearing our discussion about the death of Celtcar Magutakar between myself and my brother Aaron. Now, we started live streaming these conversations on YouTube on Sundays at 7pm Irish time over the course of the madness that was 2020. But this conversation was actually recorded before everything kicked off back in January of 2020. So we decided to take this weekend off and let you listen to that conversation. If you'd like to join us on YouTube and get in on these chats about the myths and chip in with your own comments and questions, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel for the next one. We wouldn't be able to continue to make these podcasts without the support of our patrons, which we are very grateful for. So thank you to all of you. If you'd like to contribute, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or share, subscribe, like, or you can leave a review if you like what we do. It all makes a big difference. Now sit back and enjoy this week's conversation. All right. Well, tis a rainy day in the shafas after listening to Keltkar McCother Car and Other Car. I know, I know. Other Car. Sorry, this is me taking the piss out of Irish while also not really speaking Irish, which I shouldn't really do. Yeah, I know. Um, it's a brilliant name, though. It's one of the most memorable names, and yet we don't have very many stories of Celtcar. Yet this was his death story, and what a way to go. It's um, an interesting one because the hero that is Celtcar McCuthercar, he comes up in uh, McDowell's Pig, which is another story of uh, of one of the champions of of Ulster. He doesn't really we don't really know that much about him though, I guess. He comes up in Maitala's pig and he's in the ton. Yeah. He's, he's one, one of the one Ulster of warriors in the ton. So like he shows up at the battle. Yeah. Um he's a bit of, he's at a the final battle. Bit of, yeah. Uh and he's like I mean there's that whole cycle of mythology, there's a whole lot of like minor characters who have their own stories that are mm-hmm. somewhat self contained. And this is just kind of one of them. This is one of the like semi self contained here's another dude in Ulster. At the same time as Cucullin and the Tawn and all this kind of stuff is happening. But speaking of time. <laughs> well, oh, hang on, before we get to time, because that I don't make know. Him... I think okay, okay. I feel like if you're if we're gonna talk about this story, the first and most first obvious and most thing that you have to say is doesn't like, really make sense. Yeah, like I mean, Cucullin is in it at the beginning. The first person Celtcar fights is someone who's avenging the death of his brother who was killed by Cucullin. Mm-hmm. His severed head then becomes the place where the puppy that Cucullin kills as a child when he's named Satanta in order to win the name Cucullin is born. I love it. I love it because it obviously doesn't make any like sense. And it's like never addressed. <laughs> so okay, in, okay. Do you want to do you want to talk about where your source for that is of like what the what the written down aspect of it is? Cause, like, oh, I don't remember what book I got it out of. Okay. But I know that the entire story was in the one book. It'll, it'll be in the notes once we look at the backwards, <laughs> I promise. He says, assuming I'm going to do that. Oh, um, hoping, hoping. No, I'm, I'm like, I know that I got it from a contiguous source. Right, okay. Did As in, like, one? I didn't get, this isn't one of the ones where I got, like, three different bits and put them together. Really coming down out there, and I think that this is now sleet. <laughs> I think the rain is I think frozen. It's, I think it suits the post-show story. We're in the shop. It's, it's, we're, we're trying to get a few podcasts done together uh, because of scheduling and stuff. And we're going to basically, whenever you're listening to this, it mightn't be mid-sleet February. Uh, it'll probably be but mid-March, it's, actually. It's definitely and, uh, sleet-tuary right now. Sleet-tuary is fucking freezing it's in so the shop. Is. With the heating up Yeah, full and blast. like I was trying to just put the heating on in the shop office and not in my living room so that we didn't stay in my living room for hours just chatting and would instead come out here and get some work done and the first thing Aaron did when he came in was turn on the heating. It was Baltic lads, I couldn't fucking handle it. I know, that was on purpose though. Yeah, but we got we got we got a bit of a plan set. And yeah. in terms of that plan, what the reason I like this story one of the reasons I like this story is yes, it makes no sense, but also the fact that it doesn't make sense makes it a myth. In some ways, like it makes it, it makes it, it places it within a context of Irish mythology. Right. I think because okay. one of the things there's this video that Oshin sent to me a while back uh, by the Tail Foundry, which is a YouTube They're channel awesome, yeah. who do some really cool like looks at different bits of world mythology, 
and they have a video called like why isn't Irish mythology more popular and one of the things that they cite is the fact that shit happens with no context or explanation so like in most mythologies if somebody can do magic it's because they are of the magic people they're a god or they're a demigod or they're a witch or like there's some explanation for it there's some kind of mechanic behind it whereas in Irish mythology the two of Danann and the sons of Mill meet and the two of Danann are the magical people but Amargan of the sons of Mill does some magic just cuz yeah and it's never explained it's yeah, never yeah, explained yeah. why some people can do magic and some people can't sure and like maybe everyone can do magic it's never addressed and there's and like that's really characteristic of Irish mythology I love and that. I think they're like that's the thing that's one of their things of like it's really confusing so I think a lot of people have like a difficulty with well Being this doesn't box. make sense yeah because you can't really categorize it and you don't really have clear good guys and bad guys but it's also one of the things that I remember watching that and being like but that's that's literally one of the reasons I like it mm. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah is because it doesn't make any fucking sense or like sure the the, the narrative isn't perfectly linear but like the the characters are awesome in it that this guy's death is phenomenal like well it's, his the story around the story around his death is 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 amazing um the death itself is a bit like oh well yeah I, and again as we were talking about this inside like this idea of kind of I don't know uh, master and, and dog it's kind of symbiotic of of nature and man's place within it like and I there's guess some interesting stuff with dogs in this story um, there's definitely some interesting stuff with dogs and I think it's worth saying as well when we talk about hounds in Irish mythology we're pretty much invariably talking about Irish wolfhounds there's the big huge Irish wolfhound who they're friendly they're like and they're famously beautifully tempered dogs like there's like a whole poem about how they're a lion in the chase and a lamb by the fireplace mm-hmm. and like they're really sweet dogs but they're also huge huge and tell me what tell and me like what. if if one if a wolfhound were to go crazy and yeah. attack people it could seriously do some damage yeah and like you see that in there's there, in the the Mayo Town as well. There's a guy who trains a, an army of wolfhounds, yeah, yeah, which is yeah. kind of a terrifying image. Just that image itself of like a whole army of wolfhounds. But I didn't know this that wolfhounds te- the name the reason the reason they have their name is oh yeah because they were the hounds that you used to hunt wolves. That's nuts. That's like nice. the yeah because wolves are super scary and big, and, <laughs> and I, like. Uh, super scary and big and there's this whole like bringing back the wolves thing into nature but because they're a keystone species absolutely. and like I think this is something that we're very removed from in modernity because like a lot of anyone who hasn't seen that little mini documentary about Yellowstone National Park and what happened when they brought back the cool wolves watch it. it's pretty cool it's really cool because it shows what an impact like One your predator apex has, predator yeah. has on the whole fucking ecosystem, whole system, yeah. and it transforms the entire landscape. And so there's been this push to bring back wolves. And I remember listening to, I think it was a podcast, and I can't remember which one it was, but a program about like what happens in rural communities when wolves actually come back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what happens is your kids can't play outside anymore because there's fucking wolves. <laughs> Don't shout! Um, but yeah, yeah, I, agree. But like, I mean, like your kids, your kids can get eaten. Yeah, and, that's and so the, can your dogs. And that's the kind of and that's because you're not top of the food chain anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's what's what I what I think is really interesting with this story. There's like there's this nature and wildness aspect, and yeah. wild and tame. I guess is really what it is. It's like because Keltcar Macotcar has this beautiful wolfhound who's tame around his side, and he treats it, and he he knows it. He calls by his name, and as soon as he turns his back on it, it becomes wild. It becomes fucking vicious, and it has yeah. to fend for itself. And it's the second generation of dogs that have done this. Mm. Like it's the child, it's the pup of the done mouse, yeah, which yeah. It, again is not explained. <laughs> what happened? With the Don Mouse, it's just like the widow's son had a great dog and then one day it turned around and ate him. Yeah. And like, these are dogs that are big enough that they probably could eat you. I mean, there had to be, have been literal stories of wolfhounds turning bad and, and mean. And there must have been, vicious. and there must have been. like Especially you know. if they were trained to, to eat wool or hunt wolves and there yeah. were lions in the chase. And, you know, if one was mistreated, then I'm sure it I'm sure <laughs> in the history of Ireland... There has been a feral wolf found, and that's scary. That like that <laughs> like, image in itself, because they're so big, they're huge, they're beautiful, and they're all anyone I've ever met are really beautiful and tame and lovely and cuddly. And but like imagine that 
ferocious oh, yeah. he's turning you, I think there's starting. there's a little bit of anxiety around them like that mm. comes up in this story yeah. about like what if mm. this wonderful dog that we trust with our family and that we have around us were to just suddenly go off and that's where I think you know stories whether they're myths or not they're just creations they're imaginations they're they're letting our imagination run wild a little bit on like what what if this could happen like and as an articulation of an anxiety yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. absolutely <laughs> and like this idea of letting him go and him becoming so awful and I think as well there's this idea of like I don't know taming nature for man's uh, purpose and looking at a way of, of having a system that we can you know be in control of like the dogs and then as soon as you turn around that system goes to shit because it becomes wild it becomes a jungle it becomes yes yeah. and it, it depends on you know it depends on the system and it depends on how you actually set that up but like I think we also in the modern world live most of us live at such a remove from nature that we don't have to think about that stuff. Yeah, not anymore. You know, we don't have to think about what would happen if this system got out of our control because we're so insulated from it. You know, we're sitting here in a sleet storm. Neither of us have have to worry about actually freezing. True. Because we're not going to run out of fuel because our fuel is electricity and it comes from somewhere far away from here mm. that we don't directly interact with. You know, we don't have to go out in the cold and chop wood. Or, you know, make like keep an eye on how much turf we have stockpiled for the winter because that's not that's not a concern for us because we live in cities. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, like, we're removed from that. Wildness. We're removed. We're insulated from the wildness. But also, I think that that leads us to either over romanticize it. And then you get mm. the whole kind of like, well, one should never, ever kill a dog especially if it's insane. You should be extra nice to it if it's gone crazy. Um, like there can be an over romanticization of, of wildness and sure. of animals and of, of, of nature. And there can also be like an over rejection of it, of like that's it, they're all terrifying and we shouldn't go near any of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people in the modern world are, are you know, land in one of those camps. Yeah, and I think like um, I, I'm, whenever I kind of start talking with this kind of stuff, I instantly think of our brother over Who in Guatemala. Is over in Guatemala, like farming goats and occasionally killing them with his own bare fucking hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except because, there's a knife in one of them, so it's not actually bare. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know. Um, but, but like very directly engaging with, with natural systems. Absolutely, absolutely. And then learning how permaculture would work and how how to manage that relationship between man and nature and becoming a little bit more in tune and reconnecting, I suppose, because we live in a society that is very disconnected and from all of the systems that are at play in the natural world. And I guess this story kind of shines a light on, like, you know, an, an interpretation can, like, go to shining a light on, like, what happens when you turn your back on on the natural system, which is the dog in this example, and it'll come back and it'll kind of bite you in the ass. And I think that's, in a global like look at the world, we're looking at a system that's turning around and going, well, you're not allowed to just completely screw me over because I'm going to come back and bite you in the ass. Yeah, you're not allowed to just treat nature as, as your resource to extract from whenever you feel like and not not take care of. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, there's another bit in this story which is, is not on the dog thing, but um, which I think highlights an interesting little attitude that's very different again from this. And that's the bit at the start where the people of Ulster say, hang on, Kelskar Makutakar is exiled for murder. That's like losing twice. And I think that that's like, you know, it's it's kind of the impetus for the whole story for like Krahor giving him this Eric of like, you know, come back and save Ulster three times and you'll be forgiven. Um, something fell over outside. I don't know what it was. <laughs> anyway. So, <coughs> punishment. So, um, yeah, but like there's something there about justice and punishment because I mm-hmm. think that's also a very fundamentally different way to how we look at justice today. Yeah. Because imagine if you kind of said, okay, every time you put somebody in prison, which is a form of exile from the community, you are removing... A, a potential benefit from society because you're removing all of that person's potential absolutely yeah, yeah. and you're putting them behind bars yeah. and them like away. you're shutting them away and I just think it's really interesting to see that applied to in the case of a murder because I think a lot of the time when people talk about restorative justice we're like well non-violent criminals shouldn't be put behind <laughs> bars 
but the like violent ones the violent be. ones should probably be put behind bars. And here's a society that's like, no, no, sometimes we need a violent person. Like mm. there are situations where there's a greater like, again, different time, different place, different culture, not different place, different time, <laughs> different culture, same place. Same place. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like there's a there's a yeah, very, sure. very different view of um yeah, there's a very different view of how justice should work that I think is really interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and examining that is kind of put like putting it under scrutiny in, in in kind of modern terms is like we don't have a system that really is a fair one, is a really restorative one. It is we don't have one that uh, society benefits or the the um, the I won't say the victim, the culprit uh, actually gains from it. They get punished, and that's it. Whereas I guess Kelkar, he kind of has a, he has a journey. He comes back around. And eventually, well, his dog kills him. Well, he has a path, but he also has a path back to salvation. being part of the community. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, salvation is kind of a christian word, but like, yeah, essentially, he's given, he's given a very clear signpost to say, if you do this, this and this, all is forgiven. And this is kind of a, a decision that's to benefit everyone in Ulster. And it's in line with his skill set and it's in line with what he is and what he does. And also while he's working on it, he gets to come home. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Which is which I just think is like that's a really interesting thing to think about. Like what if what if we treated criminality like this? Like you've you've taken someone away from the community by committing murder. Therefore, you have to do something to rebalance that Mm. or whatever the crime may be. I mean, like the the, the interesting ending to that, since you're looking looking at the start of the, the justice of of his uh, for punishing him for his crime, the the end result is he gets the blood spilled on him and he dies in a pretty awful way. But that's kind of well, is, he dies kind of abruptly. Yeah, like he's got this. You know, it's it's such a again, it's such a mad death story because it's a, a little bit like the Coo Colin one. There's a lot of build up, and totally. then a sudden like oh, it's over. Um, like there's a huge amount of like you know there's there's all kinds of stuff that he's doing and there's all kinds of like tricks he has to come up with to to he deal with the, the dumb mouse tree and everything yeah 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 like the tree that he turns into basically into like a rubber tube, um and and then it's just like he, he kills his dog and he gets a line in it where he's like you shamed me and then the heart blood of the dog kills him mm. and there is something there I think I think there is something maybe metaphorical or allegorical there about engagement with the animal side uh, but I don't really know what it is because again it's, it's a, yeah. as with so much in Irish mythology it is not explained no. in the text in any way and yet it, it seems like it has many branches it seems like it has many metaphors that are just, just out of reach like there's a lot there and hey look I've, I've really enjoyed going through uh, picking this story apart with you as I do with all of the stories I'd love to hear from the listeners especially on this one because if you have an opinion, if, you, if something jumped out at you, I'd love to hear from you. We would love to hear from you. No, I wouldn't. I think you're all. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> not allowed to speak don't, for Don't me. speak for me. I'm, I'm kidding. I really like hearing from people as well. But Aaron sounds more sincere when he says it, so I just let him say it. It's because I'm more sincere. I'm just like yeah fuck off uh, <laughs> and on that note uh, do fuck off uh, in a very kind way uh, <laughs> <laughs> this podcast was edited by Oisin Ryan he is a legend he does everything for us thank you Oisin uh, he also did the music for this podcast and the uh, support from Patreon has helped produce this show thank you very much for all our Patreon supporters if you want to be a supporter go to patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales yeah and if you don't want to be a Patreon supporter that is also cool uh, thank you for listening thank you for yeah. your time and uh, we'll talk to you again soon you this podcast was produced and edited by Oisin Ryan you can find out more about us on our website candlelittales.ie follow us on Facebook Instagram and Twitter at Candlelit Tales and for videos and live streams like and subscribe to our Candlelit Tales YouTube channel which now has a candle of tales for kids. Candle little tales. Liking and subscribing to our channels really helps us grow and get out to more people. And if you're able to give us more direct support, you can chip in a few bob at patreon.com forward slash candlelit tales or make a one-time donation through the PayPal button on our website. We'd love to hear back from you with any of your comments or questions. You can contact us directly or leave your question in the comments section below because what we really want to do is get these stories out there, share them with as many people as possible, And so anything you can do to help, we really appreciate. And we really appreciate you listening.